Good afternoon, <clears throat> oh, evening everybody, um, and thank you for joining us for today's critical conversation. Thank you also to my two colleagues who will be leading the conversation today. So we have Dr Eurydice Honorio and Professor Nina Laurie, um, who will introduce themselves in a moment. I'd also like to thank Dennis Del Castillo, um, who joined us for some preliminary conversations yesterday from his office in Iquitos in the Peruvian Amazon, um, but unfortunately couldn't join us today because he's in a very important meeting with the British ambassador and with our, our very own Tom Marr from biology, <clears throat> talking about uh, establishing a new botanic garden in the city of Iquitos, um, which is where Dennis works. Um, but we will be showing his face later because we pre-recorded a few snippets with him yesterday and we think um, he said some really important things that we'd like we would like to bring into this conversation so watch out for Dennis um, Eurydice and Nina and in fact Dennis as well have both done extensive field work in Peru some of which has been in peatlands um, some of it not in peatlands so they've got many experiences and thoughts to share with us today I'm Dr Lydia Cole. I'm a lecturer in the School of Geography and Sustainable Development here in St Andrews and I'll be ch chairing today's discussion. Critical conversations are live events designed to foster discussions between academics and students related to the temporary exhibitions that are currently open at the Wardlaw Museum in St Andrews. The theme of today's conversation, entitled Those Who Live by the Land, is all about what constitutes ethical fieldwork and how we might successfully achieve it. The theme is inspired by our new exhibition, For Peatland's Sake. The exhibition is currently open and it will be open until the 7th of May and explores the relationship between peatlands, communities and the planet. The exhibition showcases the people and environments that Eurydice, Nina and myself and others, um, including Katie Ruku, who was on the last Critical Conversation, um, and Shona Jenkins, um, have got to know whilst carrying out field work in peatlands, mostly in the Peruvian Amazon. Field work of some kind, gathering new data from a place, is essential in any research project in order to generate new knowledge. But field work can be done very well um, and it can be done very badly. Bad or unethical field work might lead to certain environments or certain people not being included in the process of data collection. So um, their, their ecology in the case of environments or their experiences in the case of people aren't represented in the data. And if certain voices aren't included in the research, then their perspectives aren't gathered and their stories aren't told. And the picture that we get from our research, um, our, our new knowledge is incomplete. So today we're going to talk about the challenges of carrying out ethical fieldwork and how we might address those challenges and in particular, ensure we include more voices in our research. And so represent more voices in museum exhibitions, such as um, the one that we've curated um, at the Wardlaw at the moment for Peatland's sake, uh, which we've all been involved in. So I'm honoured to have two fieldwork aficionados um, with me today to discuss this topic. Firstly, though, let's let's let them introduce themselves um, and say a little bit more about the field research that they've done in the past. So Eurydice, first, please could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your re research and fieldwork experiences? Hi, Lydia. Um, thank you for the invitation to this session of the Critical Conversations. Well, I'm a tropical ecologist. I'm also based at the School of Geography and Sustainable Development and my research focuses in on, on tropical forests and forest resources with emphasis on understanding the resilience of tropical peatlands to climate change and human impacts. Currently, I'm an Air Knowledge Exchange Fellowship Fellow, sorry, and I'm working closely with some policy makers and governmental organizations to implement strategies and policies to conserve peatlands in Peru. Most of my work has been done there, so that is why I'm still uh, focusing on this area. But also I work with an international scientist network to increase the impact of, of my research across the tropics. So my, of my work, you can see it in the exhibition for Pitland Sakes at the World of Museum. Well, about the second point, my experience of field work, I would say that this started quite a long time ago when I was a forestry student 
at the Agrarian National University in Lima, Peru. Due to the lack of forests in this city, my university well, modules involve quite a lot of practical field work and we travel to diverse forest ecosystems of Peru. So I got to know my country, the different environments that shape the different cultures and human communities that inhabit Peru. Uh, I fall in love with the Amazon rainforest, I mean to say, and this is why I accepted a job at the Peruvian Amazon Research Institute later on. And this involves to move to the Amazon and I was living in a place called Genaro Herrera. And this was a field station. This is a field station. And my daily work involved organizing several field trips uh, to collect the data, the, to gather information about the ecology of the species that were used by local people, and also set up experiments to monitor um, how sustainable these species, sustainably these species can be harvested. During my stay in Genaro Herrera, I need to say that I learned to rely on the expertise of local people to develop my, my work, and especially the field work, and also value the different skills of every participant in my field work team. Uh, all, the, all the important thing about this field work is like the skills that I developed to collaborate with other researchers, and they also needed this kind of support when coming and visiting these places. Um, and currently working at the University of St. Andrews with some of my colleagues that you will now see, with Nina, and you are meeting already Lydia, who we have been working already for a long time and building a long term collaboration. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eurydice, for that um, really great introduction to your work. A long, long period of work um, in tropical forests um, and with lots of different communities. So over to you now, Nina, please could you introduce yourself and talk a bit about um, the field work that you've done in the past and the projects? Oh, and I think Nina, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it has to happen <laughs> at some point. I was saying good evening, everybody, or good afternoon or morning, whatever time that you might be watching this um, on catch up. And uh, it, rather terrifyingly, Lydia, I have just worked out how long it is I've been doing international field work uh, on development topics. And um, let's just say it's more than 35 years, which makes me feel ancient. And uh, the first place I did international field work is Peru, and it is my first and most enduring love in, of my life, um, which doesn't always go down well uh, with my partners. But however, um, I first went as an undergraduate student to do my dissertation, and I was looking at uh, soup kitchens in times of hyperinflation um, and economic crisis in Peru. And from then on, I, I'm a human geographer, so and I mainly worked on issues of social development. I've worked in East Africa um, and I've worked also in Nepal, but mainly my my, as I said, my first love is, is Peru and I've worked a lot in neighbouring Andean countries. So I would say for me, the thing that has been most interesting in recent times um, around the peatlands work. So it, it's what got me into this is working uh, with scientists. So as a human geographer, I've always had conversations with people who are like me, who do similar sort of field work. So they might be looking at social movements, they might be interviewing people. And that was often wonderful, but, but quite isolating because you tend to do that as an individual researcher who goes in the field. And I did go in the field. I, I lived and worked in, in, in Peru um, for a period of four years, in Bolivia for two years. So it very much uh, um, was my home. But in recent years, working with scientists, scientists work in teams. And that has been really interesting experience for me in terms of field work to work with people um, who have different expertise to me, um, but also with whom at the end of the day, you can talk about the experiences that you've had um, with other researchers in that sense, but also increasingly for me working um, hand in glove with Peruvian partners over long periods of time who uh, are working in NGOs or in grassroots organisations as well. So that has really changed how I understand field work. And I would say as well that the experience of the pandemic when I was mid project um, has also changed how I think about field work. So currently I'm working on the peatlands work, but also I've been working in the northern desert, uh, coastal desert of Peru 
on El Nino and that we were just in the middle of doing that. We were going to go as a team with my Peruvian colleagues to interview um, students about intergenerational knowledge on El Nino and the pandemic came. So then we had to think about the ethics of doing fieldwork in a pandemic setting, of organising fieldwork as a team at a distance and communication um, in a context where, where really Peru is the country that has experienced the most excess deaths from COVID of anywhere in the world. So, you know, you really start to think of the relevance of what you're doing in those settings when your colleagues are ill and sadly we lost colleagues as well. So, yeah, I, I've been on quite a journey about how I think about fieldwork. It's a privilege and I'm back now to my first love of Peru, so. Thank you, Nina, for, uh, for sharing um, some of your really extensive experience that you've had um, in all sorts of environments with all sorts of people. Um, it's, it's an honour to have you both in this conversation tonight. So the, the first question I'd like to pose to you both then is um, what what does ethical fieldwork mean to you? And let's go to Nina first, reverse order. OK. Um, it's such a big question, right? And um, I often get dissertation students coming to me wanting to do something that they think is a really pressing issue. For example, um, I, I've had a number of because I do work on trafficking, have done work on trafficking of people. Um, I have students who say I want to work on trafficking and I want to go to this place to go and do it. And I have to make them think about what are the ethics of, of you as an undergraduate student diving deep into such a big topic um, and such a, a, a difficult topic. And, you know, what is our right as researchers to expect people um, to talk to us um, about particularly about things that are, are so personal and difficult? So for me, that's that is the first ethical issue which is the right that we have as researchers and as, as human beings really to delve into some of these difficult topics. Um, so, for example, working with indigenous people as, as we're doing, there are there are there are issues about um, indigenous groups that are are non contact. And we have to think about the extent to which some of the work in Amazonia might uh, lead to some of those non, non contact groups being known about, let alone being contacted. So I think the first ethical issue for me is, is um, how appropriate is it that this research, first of all, is done? And secondly, who is it done by? And I've been really privileged to develop a whole series of long term collaborations now in different places. So the work I've done on trafficking, for example, was in Nepal and that worked with an organisation that was founded and run by returnee traffic women. And it was their agenda that set the research agenda. Um, in, um, in the Peatlands Amazonian work, it's been a massive privilege to work with YAP, who Eurydice work with, because they have this long term relationship in that area and therefore they help co-design uh, as researchers themselves and as people who are uh, very closely related to the communities what are the research questions and how appropriate it is to do them? And similarly, in, in the work on El Nino, we've been working very closely, um, not only with universities, but with the municipal government and uh, with uh, the local school board as well to make sure uh, what, what we do is appropriate, but also it's ticking some of their boxes as well. Um, so that for me is an ethical issue. I'm not saying that there can't be blue skies research. I think there can be. Um, but I think in certain contexts, one has to think about uh, the relevance of it and, and the right we have to ask questions and to go places. We as researchers with a particular um, place that we come from, whoever we are, whether we're Peruvian or, or, or British. Thank you, Nina. Um, and what you said about the blue skies research as well. Um, who, who's defining which blue skies research is being done? Um, who, whose voice is defining the question? I think that's a really important point. You would see, you, I imagine that there'll be a few different ethical um, thoughts on what ethical fieldwork means for us. But uh, yeah, if you'd like to share a point now. Well, for me, uh, fieldwork is ideally organised and carried out based on ethical considerations. I say ideally because, as you already mentioned, no, it's not always done in this way. So ethical fieldwork will mean uh, to be ethical to those that get involved in the research. So 
if we are working with living organisms, with scientists, with volunteers, with indigenous communities, with uncontacted people. So we need to start thinking about them as well. Also means to be safe to those that participate. No, we need to think about health insurance, safe, the safety of the participants. If the environment is different to where they are used to and all of these issues. Also responsible and respectful when reporting the results. No, we also need to think about co-authorships and if we are collaborating in a large group, so how we could also involve them and see intellectual property as well. If we are talking to indigenous communities, no, the, the knowledge that they, they have, how we need to show respect to this information and how much can be shown or, or provided to different audiences. And as well, transparency, you know, we also need to be clear what we want to do and, and do not lie about our research. For me also, ethical fieldwork also tells what kind of professional we are or we have become and reflects a bit of the quality of our research work and some commitments that we can accept to, you know, to support those that get involved in our research. And in this point is how much we could probably provide back to these communities who are sharing all this knowledge and sometimes they also have their needs and so we could no coming to agreements and how much we could commit to, to, to provide and give information back. Uh, also, I have been mentioned about the training. No, so when we are working with students, local students, for example, investing time on training, and um, also local people also likes to us. They are also showing us the forest and they have great knowledge of how to walk in the walk and do not get less in tropical forests, for example. No, they also need some want some needs and learning about all their skills. So using a GPS, sometimes they're interested, using a mobile phone or other technology that they see that could provide some interest as well to their needs. And Nina also mentioned this about developing long term collaboration. And I think that this uh, is important and ethical when we just start doing field work and thinking not just to go and take advantage of the place that you want and just focus on your question and your research is even the most important. It's also uh, developing you know, this collaboration with the local collaborators, with the people who were getting involved and will help you in the project and being respectful to their knowledge as well. But for now. Thanks, Eurydice. Lots of great points there and I can see that Nina wants to step in so over to you Nina. Yeah yeah thanks um, you were to see for, for all of that and it was just as you were speaking I was remembering the real privilege of my week-long journey up the Chambira River to meet with the Ururina communities, the indigenous people in the peatlands areas uh, when we were first starting the project. And one of the things under Peruvian law that is really important is that any research needs prior consent, the same as any mining concessions, any sort of interaction now uh, with, with people in particular communities needs prior consent. And YAP, the Institute of Amazonian Studies, had always worked like this. And so when we started our project, um, we went with our YAP colleagues and also with a member of the Ministry of Culture to visit the Urarina communities along uh, along this river and, you know, admitting pink dolphins and stunning, uh, stunning sunsets. We would visit the communities and ask, present what the research project was um, and ask for their permission and at the same time talk about what benefits uh, it will bring them. So one of the things that Eurydice has worked on in the past is um, alternative ways of harvesting some of the fruit, the aguaje fruit from the forests um, and working with an organisation that teaches local community members how to climb trees so that they don't um, have to chop down the tree to get the product. So one of the things that we did was write some of that into the initial uh, grant application um, through part of the the prior consent. So we were able uh, to present that. Now, when I say we, um, basically these communities have hardly any Spanish. Um, so a lot of this was done through a translator. So that's another ethical issue. And again, by Peruvian law, um, if, for example, a mining company wants to go somewhere, they have to present their proposals in the local language. 
researchers try, but there's not the same um, not the same requirement. The same as in the UK, you know, you could you could go to a, a, a predominantly Gaelic speaking community, but there wouldn't be a rule that you have to go and speak in Gaelic to get get prior consent to work there. So I think there are really interesting issues around language. But that was a really profound um, experience as, as, as starting off off that project. Um, so we have ethics forms and our students, we all have to get them to sign these ethics forms and, you know, and prior consent. But we really need to think about what people understand by what they're consenting to. So are they consenting for their information to be shared in different formats? Are they consenting to their pictures? being taken, etc. And one of the things, one of the dilemmas as well is that you might have informed consent and then further down the line, something's really important that people have said to you, but you might not have the right consents uh, to be able to share that information. So I, I think there is a lot about language that's important to think about um, ethically as well. And that these things need to be constantly reviewed. It's not that you, you, you put in an ethics application and it all stays the same. Like I said, we were ended up doing research at the time of, of COVID and we really did have to ask ourselves um, how ethical that was um, and then think about other research. So our, our colleague Tanya Mendo, for example, um, shifted tack and did a research on artisanal fisheries in Peru that that looked at the implications of COVID. So there's also that ethical responsibility that comes with the long term relationship with the place to think what are the needs. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, the language creates all sorts of challenges, I guess, with um, being able well, language and culture where we're coming from very different backgrounds and um, different ways of communicating to communicate the process of um, what we're doing. And as you said, how the ethical implications might change over time. Um, Nina, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, I, do, I, I, I meant to say that one of the really great things that Dennis said yesterday was I, I was saying how much I had learned from working with Eurydice and, and with YAP in terms of what the difference is when you work with the state as opposed to working with an NGO that has a short term project that 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 um, just parachutes in. And I, I don't know if it's possible to share what he said, but it is really, I think, helpful to hear it um, from his perspective as well, the importance of working through an organisation like YAP that works closely with the state. So I said somebody from the Ministry of Culture, for example, came with us. I don't know if it's possible to share that. Over here in Peru and in general, Latin America, it's quite difficult for people working in science to separate with business activities. And mm. sometimes there is an overlapping. So we have to have very high standard of ethics to separate private private activities with research and science. And that's a constantly. Uh, we have to have a very high standard of ethics in order to be able to separate those things. Otherwise, it's very easy to get in, involved in business activities. Private activities, which is not, uh, it's not uh, wrong, nothing wrong with that. But sometimes there is some conflicts when we do at the same time those things, those activities. We have to have very high standard of ethics in order mm -hmm. to be able to separate those. So thanks to Dennis in his absence for sharing that point with us. And Nina has a has her hand raised. Oh, Tina. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that as uh, academics working in universities in somewhere like Scotland that it, it's easy to forget is the privilege of our position. You know, I say this on an eve, eve of, of, of a strike, so I don't say this lightly, um, but it is easy to forget the situation of researchers in other countries. So somebody working in a state university in Peru, for example, would have to have some separate role in consultancy in order just to, to, to make ends meet. So the sorts of conflicts of interest that um, Dennis is talking about for individual researchers um, needs careful 
handling in an organization like like yap and i'm sure um, you would have seen can, yeah, can you know, a bit more when about we write grant proposals as researchers and we um, really do the, have to be the, very aware the, of the one of the, we want to, to hear from dennis about in a minute colleagues is, is also the difference that it makes and, um, in terms of this long term you would have said something really interesting to us yesterday about health cover and field work for example you would have said, i don't know if you want to share that with with the group about um health insurance and things very practical issues yes thanks Nina, for bringing that topic well um until you don't have an accident probably you you stop thinking about these issues but in my experience when we started seeing a lot of people coming into peru from other countries it was very common that they have a health insurance so in Peru, that is not common. That is not very common. So we started raising the awareness, know that it was unfair to go into the field and if something happened to the main researcher, well, they, everything is covered. And then what about the others? No, what about the rest of the team? And we started you know, raising this awareness. I was, it was not it's just that we don't know that situation in other, in other countries. So it's good to, that we can have this tick, no, to say health insurance is important and not just for one, it's for everyone. And we need to treat each person with the same respect if, because every person in the team will become important when we are doing field work. From the person who does the cooking to the person who takes the data in the field. So everyone become important to us. Thanks, Eurydice. Um, let's pass back to Nina. Who... Yeah, and and just to add to that, I was alluding to the research um, carried out under the pandemic, and um, you know, at, at this point, there were issues about who 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 was vaccinated and who wasn't in in Peru, and who could go places, and even access to um, testing. So, in our work in northern Peru, for example, we were able to um, redesignate all of the travel budget because obviously we weren't traveling to um, uh, buy computer tablets and get uh, the school children online with a data package in order to be able to receive the the, the distance learning from the states. Um, education system, but also to be able to learn how to do oral histories as part of our project. And um, that was a really, really powerful lifeline for, for those families who participated. Um, however, even the hand, handing over of the tablets was absolutely massive in terms of, of, of health issues. And our our NGO partner has the same attitude as YAP, which is that every every Peruvian working in in with the NGO has health insurance. But then we had to think about okay, the health cover for anybody going to pick up the tablets and the biosecurity around all of that. And I think that some of those things we learned in um, COVID have actually stayed certainly stayed with me in terms of if I were planning uh, more field work in in difficult um, circumstances. So the other thing I just wanted to say on the ethical point is what is an equitable partnership? What does it mean to really work equitably? And in my 35 years of doing international field work, I, I remain shocked at how many people based in uh, northern universities um, go to countries and they meet colleagues and they treat them as sources of information. So these are experts. These are people who in their own right really know their stuff. But what happens um, often, far too often still, is that people will go, they'll work in a team, but they will make a direct quote from somebody as if they're a source in the field as opposed to an expert. So they use their analysis, but they're, they're write it up in qualitative quotations, for example, rather than having somebody as a, a co-publisher in research or as an expert in their own right. And a lot of this comes back to language as well, that those people might be writing up in English and they're translating what somebody has said to them in, in, in Spanish. Um, but I think that there, there is a, there is, we really have to work hard, put budgets into, and spend time on building equitable partnerships and and treating colleagues um, in an, it, as as part of that. And as I've said, we've been really fortunate in in my school to have those partnerships with YAP and with the NGO Prisma that I work with in Northern Peru, and the ones that our colleague Tanya also has with with the Agrarian University. 
but but not everybody behaves like that and, and it still drives me absolutely makes me furious and um one of the things in lockdown that was absolutely great is that um a couple of my students at the time of first year and a second year um wanted to know what they could do to to to, to support the work and they set up um, so my, Maya and Gabrielle um, basically set up WhatsApp groups to so that my early career Peruvian colleagues who were learning English but never had anybody to practice with, they, they practiced um, English language training with them on a regular basis um, for, you know, three, four, five months in some cases. And it was really important. That's a really great thing that our students can, can can do as volunteers and it's all part of this building equitable partnerships and not being extractive. Yeah, thank you, Nina. So many really valuable points that you brought up there and I think equity across the team and thinking about each member of that team and what their needs are and how you can create opportunities for everybody in the team, I think is so important. And as you said, that can take quite a lot of time. So we maybe need to think about as, as one key action that it will take longer than us rushing in, collecting some data and running out again. Um, so we need to think about these these long term relationship building um, exercises. In the last about uh, eight minutes or something, I would love to get from you both and, and I'll start with you, Ridicy, one action um, that you think people could take in order to um, achieve more equitable field work experiences um, and perhaps you could think about what piece of advice you might give to an undergrad who's starting on their journey of doing field work. So you're ready to see over to you. Okay thanks. Well it's difficult to think of just one action is it's just a few steps of actions that you need to think about like preparing your information be ready to explain your project in a clear way without lying without raising expectations think about research permits i know that they are paying but you need to respect the rules of it, the place where you the country that you are visiting you need to be respectful to those that but will participate so it's not just the most important the research but also how the research will be developed and those people who really will engage with you and during research you also need during the field work you also need to be patient and be open to changes because everything can get really badly and wrong so you need to be open and and be there to just to not only to be able to teach but also to learn from others and that is also very important to me and after field work be considered no and those that help you also need to be recognised. I will say you those steps. Very short, friends. OK. Very useful steps. Thanks, Eurydice. Um, Really excellent. I think everybody should watch back um, this interview before they embark on any fieldwork in future. Uh, Nina, what would you like to add? Yeah, well, I think I've made my point about um, language. We can all offer something. Um, and I would really encourage my students to think about, you know, their skills in English. And it's something that Dennis said that he would really welcome um, those sorts of language practices for uh, practicing opportunities for for YAP students. So that that YAP early career uh, scholars. So that's something we can think about. I think uh, Lydia maybe as a school. But the other thing I would want to say is don't think of it as field work. Um, certainly don't think of it as. Uh, Physical geographers sometimes talk about field campaigns. My goodness, that's so scary. Um, think about it uh, uh, more as exchange and something for the long term. So and and the fact that what happens on the first first visit might then inform stuff further down the line. So when I said we did the, the computer tablets and the data packages with the school children, we were all really thrilled about it and my colleagues were thrilled and we, you know, it was really something tangible in the pandemic. And um, then we looked at the data and the quality of the material was absolutely rubbish. It was really, really poor. Uh, the, the videos and all of that, that was fine. But we had assumed when we reflected on it as a team with my Peruvian colleagues, we had assumed that within those households, the children, the students would automatically know how to talk to their parents and their grandparents and vice versa. We'd assumed this 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 level of engagement and interaction already. And and by taking a pause and analysing our data in the field to, to use the language, we realised that we'd been mistaken and, and that, that we'd we'd had an assumption 
that 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 was a, a mis, misplaced assumption. And this is my proving colleagues who've been working in this sector for a long time. So I, I would say, and this is the real benefit of working in a team, I would say um, take the time when you're in the field uh, doing field work. Don't think about it as a visit to the field. Think about it as an ongoing relationship and take time to do the first set of analysis and reflection with colleagues and think about, OK, if that didn't quite work or it's not telling me what I thought it needed to tell me, what am I missing here? And, and, and what we then did is we redesigned the type of teaching we were doing in order then um, to get better data, but actually everybody became involved in the analysis process as well. So my thing would be do, is, is to think really carefully about the relationship between so-called data gathering and data analysis and think about it as an iterative process that is co-produced with wherever possible collaborators um, and maybe with the people who are producing the data themselves. Now that's okay for me as a human geographer because of the types of data I'm, I'm using, but Eurydice has some amazing colleagues who are field guides, but actually know far more than how to get to a certain plot in order to get the, the results that are needed and, and who become part of the discussion of the data as well. So that that would be my bit of advice. And that's and when you do that, make sure that they are fully acknowledged and that might be putting them as co-authors of the paper, not just saying thank you to them in the acknowledgement section. Thank you, Nina. Excellent points and so uh, also applicable to physical geography and the physical sciences. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the amazing field assistance colleagues, really not assistants who I worked with when I was working at YAP. Um, so thank you to them. You really see, I think you probably had a final point. Yes. Yes, I was thinking about the cultural differences and we need to be ready for that, like kind of coming from the UK and probably you have the chance to go and do your field work on other environments, other cultures. So you need to be ready for this difference and being respectful, understanding that difference is important. And and, and last point about gender issues. And, and this is something that probably we don't talk much, but in my work in Peru, being a woman, it became like kind of a bit of a challenge there. And um, we had rules on how do we could also engage other women to participate in field work, even though some people disagree sometimes. So also these challenges, you don't expect that it will ha just happen by itself, but you need to raise this awareness and also no, you promote that these uh, women can be included as well. No? So just a couple of points. Thanks, Eurydice. Um, really valuable um, reflections. Nina. Yes, uh, Lydia, I, I want to throw this back at you uh, as our chair, and I know that you um, spent a long time uh, in on the tropical peatlands work. What would you do differently now if, if we could start that 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 lever Hume project again, all of us? What, what would Lydia do differently about her field work when you went? Sorry, we haven't thanks. said this, but yeah, I'm really thank curious. You. Yeah, thank you for asking, Nina. Um, well, first of all, I, I loved the way that you um, suggested we reframe fieldwork to field exchanges. And I think for me, I would love there to have been more time um, to spend with the people that I was working with, both the ecologists that I was working with from YAP, but also um, the people in the field and my experience was that I was the ecologist on the project and so I went out into the forest and I measured um, trees basically and, and um, soil characteristics during the day and then came back and I didn't get to really work with the communities that I was living in um, and partly because my language skills weren't good enough. Um, so even as a as a physical scientist but I, I, I'm kind of trying to bridge um, uh, the natural sciences as well as the social sciences, I would have loved more of an opportunity to, to carry out a field exchange rather than perhaps what felt a bit more like a field trip. Um, but I think bringing, um, thinking of any sort of field 
work field trips as a team endeavor and thinking about who every member of that team is and how you can create opportunities for them not just during the time that you're there for um, but ongoing this is part of somebody's career um, so how can we support them especially from the place of privilege that I'm coming from um, and and think about that long term engagement and that brings in all sorts of questions around sustainability as well um, financial carbon etc so thank you very much for asking me and Nina another thought yeah I love that I love that answer Lydia and and um, what I would like to say to you is that you were an invaluable part of member of the team so while you couldn't do absolutely everything I think the fact that that partnership worked with YAP, which is, as we said, a state organisation, and that you were then fitting into all of the networks that Eurydice had built over years, and also working through the networks with Leeds University, I think that can also make up for, for all of our inadequacies. And I would really love if it's possible um, for us to just finish with the short uh, message from Dennis about how he sees the difference of working in an organization that engages with the state. Uh, thank you for mentioning the difference between a, a state institution like IAP and NGOs. For us, that's a, that's a very important point. Because in general, I'm not saying everyone, but in general, when they, an NGO start working with local communities, the commitment is, well, two, three, four years, depending on the funding. But what happened with the app? We are the state. We are going to stay here in the place. So when we talk about talking about local to local communities about what we should be doing, we are thinking in terms of long term mm. commitment. And that makes a difference. Because one thing is an activity of two or three years, another thing is a commitment that you stay here. Because the local communities are going to be here looking at the app. At least the next 50 years. <laughs> so that's a very important point. And that's a point very difficult to to say what's ethic or not ethic, but mm. that's the difference. Dennis has left us with a very important point about the long term relationships. Um, which is, as I said, a central part of thinking about sustainability across the board. So I think we, we've reached the end of our time, um, though this conversation could go on for hours longer, I think. Um, I'd like to thank again so much Eurydice and Nina um, for, for bringing in some fascinating insights and thoughts over the last 45 minutes. Um, thank you all of you as well for listening in, whether live or um, afterwards. If you can, do pop along to the exhibition at the Wardlaw. Um, there are some really beautiful parts to the exhibition that will bring peatlands alive to you and help you to reflect on some of these things that we've talked about today um, around fieldwork. Have a look also on the Wardlaw website for the list of events um, for all ages associated with the exhibition that you can get involved in. Um, there'll be another critical conversation on Tuesday the 11th of April where we'll be discussing the question, can museums influence behavioural change? So please join me again then. And thank you to you all again for listening and to um, my co-presenters and goodbye for now.